Halleluja. I don't know about you, but I can't believe that we are at the end of the year. And uh, we must have had fun because it went by so quickly. And I'm believing that next year it's going to go by even faster because I believe we're going to have more fun next year in this ministry than we had this past year because we have a lot of things planned and I know God's got a lot of things uh, in his sleeve that he's going to pull out for us. So we're just looking forward to next year. Be sure to be at the vision meeting. And you'll find out what God has uh, given us for next year. So, since we're looking at celebrating the birth of Christ in a couple weeks, today I'm going to begin a two-part message. It's too much to do in one message, so these two messages that I'm going to bring you, I'm going to enroll you in the School of Christmas 101. So today is part one, and uh, I want us to see the birth of Christ through heaven's eyes and not through worldly traditional eyes, which hundreds of thousands, maybe a few million people only see the birth of Christ through traditional eyes or religious eyes. And, uh, and I don't have to tell you that the earthly worldly view is grossly distorted. It's distorted. The way they celebrate Christmas, the way they believe, is totally distorted. That even the celebration of Christmas itself is light years away from the truth. The meaning of the circumstances surrounding the birth of Christ is even unknown to professing believers. If the exact time of his birth means anything, and it doesn't, we would miss it by a mile. December 25th is nowhere near the time of year that the Christ was born. We know it by the shepherds in the field, but the Word of God tells us the exact time. The exact time. In fact, Paul tells us in Galatians the exact time. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, But when the right time came, God sent His Son, born of a woman, subject to the law. So let's not bicker on the date, but let's rejoice that he came at the right time. <laughs> he came at the right time. God knew the exact time. The exact time is the right time. And thank God that he came at the right time in my life and the right time in your life. He wasn't a second late. He was at the exact time Christ came to change your life. So, the reason he came, he testified to him by himself why he came in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. He said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. That was you, that was me, and he came at the right time to do that. Thank God that he didn't wait any longer in my life because I was heading down a road to destruction. Thank God that he came at the right time. But when we look at the way Christ came, what is the objective of God in having Christ come in the way that he did? That's the things we have to understand. See, he came uh, uh, a way to undercut the sinful nature of man, which is the pride of life. See, the destruction of man is his own pride, the pride of life. So when Christ came, he had to undercut everything that is 
has to do with the pride of man. In fact, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 says this, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. So when Christ came, he had to be disconnected from any of that, anything of the world. The circumstances in which Christ entered the world undercut the, undercut the pride of life and the spiritual pride in the religious realm. He had to even undercut that. He didn't come through a denomination. He didn't come through a religious sect. He even had to undercut all of that. Now, the circumstances which Christ entered the world, which probably the majority of Christians on the earth don't understand, that Christ had to come totally detached from mankind. He had to be totally separated from mankind when he came to undercut the pride of life of man. So this two-part series I'm going to bring you will cover Six signs of, Christ, of Christmas. So three today, three next Sunday, and when you finish next Sunday, you will graduate from the school of Christmas. So the first sign we're going to cover today in the school of Christmas 101 is the sign of the virgin birth. Everybody understand, but they don't really understand why it had to happen the way it did. The first mention of the birth of Christ is in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, in the beginning of the book, the very beginning of the Bible, it tells us of the birth of Christ that happened 2,000 years ago. This happened after Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, and the Lord was speaking to Satan, who deceived the woman Eve to sin, the Lord revealed to Satan, our enemy, what his future demise was going to be. The Lord spoke to Satan in Genesis 3.15. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Not the man, but the woman. He says, in between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So right then, in the beginning of the word of God, it tells us that there's going to be somebody coming who's going to crush the head of Satan. This is the first mention of the coming of Christ. The seed of the woman, not the man, but the seed of the woman was going to bruise Satan's head. 800 years before the birth of Christ, there was a prophecy concerning the virgin birth by the prophet Isaiah. This is the beautiful thing about the birth of Christ. It just didn't happen accidentally. It was already planned of God. It was prophesied by prophets the exact time in which it was going to come. So the first mention of the coming of Christ, the seed of the woman, that was going to bruise Satan's head 800 years before it actually happened. There was a prophecy in, in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. See, here's a sign. I want to talk about th six signs. Here's the sign, the first sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, the name Emmanuel means God with us. Thank God. This is sign number one. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son. So what does that really mean? Why? What does that really mean? The virgin shall conceive and bear a son. It means that man has nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. Man is completely ruled out of the salvation of mankind. Man has nothing to do with that. Just as man has nothing to do when people get born again of the spirit of the living God. See, it's not a preacher. 
A preacher don't do that. I remember years ago when I was uh, pastoring in Chalmette, I was doing a Bible study in my brother-in-law's house here in Metairie, and one of his son's friends, remember Jed? Jed gets saved. He gets saved in the Bible. He lights up like a Christmas tree. And after the study was over, he came and hugged me. He says, thank you, uh, Pastor Carl, for saving me. I said, hold up. I didn't do a thing. I didn't do a thing. I can't save a flea. I can't save anybody. It's God. I said, what happened to you is God. It's the supernatural work of God. You believed on the message, and then, boom, God touches you. You become born again. has nothing to do with me. It's nothing to do with any preacher. We're just messengers of the message. When you believe the message, then somehow you come into contact with the living God. So, preachers preach, but the Lord does the saving. The Apostle John stated it like this in John chapter 1, verse 12. I love this scripture. It says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. See, of God. Man has nothing to do with being born again and having eternal life. It's all about God. Christianity is not a man-made religion but it's the preaching of the gospel by which somebody can come into contact and relationship with the living God. I didn't even know what kind of church I was in when I got saved. All I knew that somehow I got in touch with something that was supernatural, and it was God. And that all, that's all that matters. God created Adam and Eve. He called them both man. So man really has a strong side and a weak side. Man has a strong side and a weak side. The Bible says that the woman is the weaker vessel. Of course, today, society don't want to admit that. They want to think that women and men are the same. They are not the same. One's a man, one's a woman. They are not the same. They try to make them the same, but they're not the same. The women are of a weaker vessel. That's God. That's not man. God said that. So Christ came through man's weak side, not the strength side. God came through through man's weak side, which was the woman, not only a woman, it was a teenager, probably 17, 18 years old was a weak side, was a a young woman, a virgin. This is how God came in. And it's only man's weakness that he will ever enter the kingdom of God. You have to become weak in yourself to ever accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. Man's pride will never enter the kingdom of God. You can forget about it. Unless you humble yourself (laughs) and realize you're a sinner without hope and loss, you will never come into the kingdom of God. The virgin will conceive. This is man's weak side. The virgin will conceive. And like I said, all indications of the scripture is that she had to be a teenager probably an older teenager, 17, 18, 19. But this young virgin, the Bible tells us, was met by the angel Gabriel. Luke chapter 1, verse 28. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. 
He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. So this is the pathway, the new heavenly man, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the anointed one, was going to come. This is the pathway through a virgin who in humility and in weakness, submitting herself to the will of God, this is how he came. He didn't come to man's strength. He came to the weak side of mankind. This child would be the beginning of a new race. Today, let me tell you, this world, this world, especially this government we have today, is trying to put race against race, putting the white people against the black people, putting the Latinos against whoever. They're trying to make us separate. But let me tell you something. When Jesus came, he came to make a new race. You hear what I'm telling you? And I want to tell you, it's a distinct people that's on earth. It's a new race. It's the people of God. They would come in all colors. They would come in all sizes. They would come in all models. They would come in all cultures. They will come, but they're one new race. It's God's people filled with God's spirit. That's what he came to do. And he came to the weak side of mankind. He came to bring a new race of people who would have the spirit of God in them. They would have eternal life in them. And they would have heaven guaranteed them. Christ would enter this way to undercut the sinful nature of man. That's, he him what? Man can't boast about anything. That's what Paul said. I can't, I can't boast about anything but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I can't take a credit for anything. Anything. No preacher can. No church can. Everything is of God. So Christ would enter this way to undercut the sinful nature of man and undercut the devil's work. The Apostle John gives us the reason here in 1 John 3, 8. He says, he who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Guess what? How does Christ destroy the devil's work? Well, I tell you, every person who is saved and born again is one less person the devil has to use to do his dirty work. So this is how God undercut not only mankind, but he undercut the devil's work also. He, every time a person gets saved, listen, I was a, I was a faithful worker of the devil. I did what he said, anytime he said, anywhere he said, but that's no longer. He lost a servant back in 1972. He lost him. I'm working for the king now, the king of kings and lord of lords. So the virgin birth undercut sinful man and the devil's wicked plan, he undercut it. He's undercutting it now. Every time we reach a soul for Christ, we undercut the devil's plan. Whatever plan the devil had for that person is going to be undercut. That's why we do what we do. So the first sign was the virgin birth to undercut the pride of mankind. The second sign, give me my water, babe. 
The second sign Thank you, baby. See whose name's on there, huh? So don't be drinking out of my cup. <laughs> Hallelujah. The second sign is the unimportant town in which he was born. That is the town of Bethlehem. There was no accident here. What no accident that he was born in Bethlehem. It was prophesied 700 years before it even happened. The prophet Micah prophesied in Micah 5 2. He said, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, through you, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be the ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. So God even revealed the town in which the Savior was going to be born of a virgin, the town. So what is so special about this town? Well, the name Bethlehem has a double meaning. The first meaning means the house of bread. The second meaning is the house of war. So when you hear and sing the Christmas song, O little town of Bethlehem, don't we sing that? You will know what you're singing about, okay? I want to read the first and last verse of that song. It says, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in the dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. O holy child, this is the last verse, of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. That's it. So when you sing that song, you're going to know that's what it's about. So you'll know what the name means. So it's fitting that Christ would come out of a town that is called the house of bread. You got that? The house of bread. Because Jesus said this in John 6, 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. That's why he was born in the house of bread, because he is the bread. He is the bread. Jesus is the bread of life, which believers live on. We have to have him. We have to feed upon Jesus. We can't feed upon the things of this world. We can't feed off the things of this world. The believer in Jesus feeds off of him. We go to the house of bread, which is in Bethlehem, who is that young baby boy named Jesus. To the wicked unbeliever, Bethlehem is the house of war. Bethlehem is also called the city of David. David was a man of war. So this, this city where he came from is representing two things. It's the house of bread and it's the house of war. Jesus himself stated this in Matthew 10, 34. Do not suppose that I've come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. See, we are in a war. Christianity is in a war. Every believer is in a war. We're not fight, fighting against flesh and blood like wars do. We're fighting against principalities and powers and, 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 and wickedness in high places. That's what we are fighting. He came to start a spiritual war. He said he came to even divide families. There's going, to, there's going to be father against son, son against father. There's going to be a division. Why? Is that going to be physical? No. There's going to be a spiritual war that will take place when somebody gets saved in a household. A war will start. 
But let's look at the other name of this town of Bethlehem. It stated that it is Bethlehem Ephrata. Ephrata. Mean, Ephrata means fruitfulness and abundance. Then Jesus said, the, 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 the enemy comes to rob, to steal, and destroy. But I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly to the full. See, when you get saved, Jesus doesn't want you just to get by. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to be fruitful. He wants you to have abundance. You see, when we come to Christ, when we cut the, the Christ that came out of Bethlehem, we come to the house of bread, to a place of fruitfulness and abundance. I can't tell you, when I was 27 years old, lost, I was destitute. I had nothing going for me. My life was not fruitful. But the moment Christ came into my life, the windows of heaven opened up and fruitfulness and abundance began to come my way. And I'll tell that to anybody. You have nothing to lose coming to Jesus. You have everything to gain coming to Jesus. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you're the branches. If any man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit apart from me. You can do nothing. When we come to Christ, we come to glorious Bethlehem Ephrathah. That's who you're coming to. You're coming to a place of bread and fruitfulness and abundance. Bethlehem was a small, insignificant town which had little importance. But guess what? It would bring forth the Son of God, the King of the Jews, the Savior of the world, the King of kings and Lord of lords. These signs that we're going to be covering and we're following or the working of a divine principle. You'll see God had a divine principle, even in the name of the town, everything, the diversion, everything. He had a divine principle that is undercutting of the pride of life, which is the value of to man. Pride is the thing, listen to me. Why do people don't come to Jesus? Why? Why, why isn't the church, church winning the world? Well, there's still pride here. The pride is the thing that will send people to hell. Pride will keep you from repenting. Pride will keep you from believing. Pride will keep you from receiving. Pride will keep you from everything God has for you, and pride will send you to hell. That's why God had to undercut man. He had, to, he had to come in a way that may, it would blow man's mind. Now, this can't be. How can this be? Oh, born of a virgin, that's impossible. No, it's not. Not with God. It's not impossible. Why he had to be born the way he did? That's God. He's got a plan. The third sign of Christmas is this. It's the sign of the manger. See, you're going to learn something here today. You're going you're gonna to graduate from the school of Christmas. So this Christmas, you're going to understand what in the world is going on. It's the sign of the manger. Let's look at this sign. In Luke chapter 2, verse 8, it says, There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby keeping watch over flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, 
the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. The angel Gabriel said this to the shepherds, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Now, what is this sign? What does it really mean? Well, the significance of being in a manger is this. A manger was a trough where animals ate out of. Where raw food was placed there for animals. What a place for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to be put. Surely he should have been born in a palace, right? He's a king. Why, why wasn't he born in a palace that had all the worldly comforts and all the worldly status and pomp and circumstance? Why wasn't he born there? But no. See, he undercut. He undercut the importance of this world. All the glorying of the flesh and the pride of life, he undercut it. All the things in life that keep mankind from co coming to God, he undercut it. A manger is the perfect place for Christ to be laid. It was the perfect place because even animals know that food would be in the manger. Remember, he's the bread of life. If he's food, he's got to be placed in the manger because even animals know where to go. The food that would give life to entire world was placed in a manger. Jesus said this in John chapter 6, verse 48. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died. But he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He was put in a place where food was to be eaten. See, Jesus himself is the bread of life, and the world don't even know it. Now picture this. How many of these manger scenes are going to be erected? And how many people are going to walk past there and look in there and don't have a clue? Don't have a clue of what they're even looking at or what that even represents. See, Christmas season is a time of commercialism, materialism at its peak. This is it. This is the time where we're buying. This is when we're buying, we're getting, we're, we're, we're celebrating by buying material things. And the very things that take people farther from the truth of the birth of Christ takes them farther away. Even religious activities are going to increase. Oh, they they we they gonna have Christmas plays, we're gonna have musicals, we're gonna we're gonna do all these things, we're gonna do all these plays, we're gonna do all these things, and we're gonna ask people to come and watch, and when they come and watch, they still don't have a clue 
of what it all means. There will be manger scenes with a figure of a baby in it. And the hundreds of thousands of people that will walk by and look and not have a clue on the meaning of the scene. You know the meaning of the scene? You had a virgin that just gave birth. A virgin that just gave birth in an unimportant city, Bethlehem. There was no place to put him. She had to put him in a manger. And people don't have a clue of what they're looking at, that the child represented there was born of a virgin, born of God. He came from heaven. That stable... And that manger was in the town of Bethlehem, Ephrathah, the house of bread and a place of fruitfulness and abundance. The food that would give eternal life to everybody on the face of the earth was laying in a trough, in a manger. The truth of the scene is hidden from those who look at it. They are so close to it, but yet so far away. They look at it and think they know what they're looking at, but they don't. We need to come to Bethlehem, the house of bread. We need to eat from the manger, which is Christ. We need to remember not only this time of year, but every day of our life where our food comes from. That the one that was lying in the manger was the one who lived a sinful life and gave himself for a world of sinners like you and me. That's why he came. And he had to come from heaven. He had to undercut everything this world was about to do it. In December 1972, I stood before the church at Lakeview Christian Center, I testified. I was only saved for about two months. And I testified before church. I said, for the first 27 years of my life, I celebrated Chris Christmas, had no idea. I said, but no more. I said, because that child, that child, that we celebrate his birth, wound up on the cross of Calvary for me. Say, so I got the whole picture now. Just don't see the birth of a child. No, I see the birth of a savior, someone who saved me. My life was changed forever, for eternity. Because the birth of that baby is what brought me new life when I repented and accepted him as Lord of my life. When I realized that the baby in the manger ended up on a cross. See, if they don't see that, they just see the manger scene and don't see the cross, they don't have a clue what they're looking at. Now, I can celebrate the birth of Christ with the reality of it all. You see, because he brought eternal life to me, the only people on the face of the earth, unless you've been born again by the spirit of the living God, what in the world are you celebrating? There are millions upon millions of people that will be celebrating a holiday that they don't even have a clue. The only people that can do it and celebrate it in reality are those who have come to Christ, had their sins forgiven, had been reborn 
by the Spirit of the living God is the only people. There will be religious people. Oh, they're going to be flocking into churches. They go for Easter and they go for Christmas. They don't have a clue. They don't have a clue of the birth. They don't have a clue of resurrection. They don't have a clue of anything. The only people that can actually celebrate any day like that are those who have been born again. Those whose life has been changed by believing the one that was not only born in Bethlehem, but the one who became the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. The baby lying in the manger is the same one who hung on a cross. Same one. Same one. And I have to ask you today, do you know him? Do you know the Christ of Christmas? Do you know him? Not just a holiday. Do you know him as not just a baby in a manger, but the one who died on the cross for you? I want you to bow your heads with me for a minute. You might be here today say, Pastor, I never heard.